All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm a little late. I was washing my hands. Um, here with Josh, you know, who's the COO, and Jeff Flax, who's took over as CEO at Hartford Hospital um, July 1st. So it's been a pretty busy time. And uh, you just know it was exactly three weeks ago that I was at Danbury Hospital when we had our very first um, COVID-related infection. And now, three weeks later, we have 1,291 folks who have been infected. In this last day, we had um, 1,900 tests. You may say, I thought we were doing less tests, uh, slightly, but more to the point, a lot of results came in. A lot of results came in from the out-of-state um, labs. Of those 1,900 tests, 279 came back positive. A uh, little interesting, that's a big number, the biggest number we've had, but the lowest percentage in a while. That's 15% of the uh, total tests. Uh, we're still analyzing that data, but may reflect the fact that with more drive-through testing, some folks who are less severe were more likely to be tested. And um, 173 hospitalizations. And that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit today, because that's the beginning of the surge, the beginning of the um, folks going into the ICUs needing a hospitalization. By the way, 27 fatalities now on three weeks. Uh, in terms of those hospitalizations, I can tell you, you are um, 10 times more likely to be hospitalized if you're over 80 than if you're under 50, 10 times more likely. So, we're preparing for this surge, and as we've described before, what we're doing in terms of facilities, which we can control. I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing in terms of personnel, um, which we have some control over. The biggest issue, which we'll get into a little bit right now, again, is the protective equipment, the masks, ventilators, and the such. You heard from our senators yesterday, Senators Blumenthal and Murphy, in terms of the $2.2 trillion bill that came through the Senate. It just passed in the House of Representatives. I believe it will be on the President's desk, uh, hopefully by the time this press conference is over. And we'll be seeing that money pretty soon, and I think you can count on that probably in the next uh, three-plus weeks. Count on it. We'll see. Show me the money, but um, we're going to get ready. And in the meantime, we have that bridge loan program that we've described to you before which is already cashed out. We've had so many people applying for that loan program. We're now trying to get through that as a bridge to the federal loan program to help support our small businesses. When it comes to the PPE, the protective equipment and the such, um, maybe it's show me the equipment as well. You know, Josh can tell you that um, a lot of equipment was scheduled to arrive right now. And some of it's been pushed back. Uh, the thermometers till next week, thermometers, 3,000 thermometers, very important because that's a way to self-test people going into, say, the factory floor, construction sites, hospitals, uh, daycare. I'm pretty sure that'll be here next week. Pretty sure is the operative word. And some of the other uh, PPE equipment, including the um, surgical gowns and the such, uh, delayed until next month. So we've got a take care of what we can take care of ourselves. And I got to tell you, I've been just extraordinarily impressed by the generosity and by the ingenuity of the people of Connecticut. Um, you know, when it comes to generosity, um, Stanley Black and Decker, you were just telling me, donated 75,000 surgical masks to a Hartford Health, which has hospitals, as you know, uh, all over the state. The tribes um, have donated over one million surgical gloves. And what that means in terms of uh, folks who are handling food, working with kids, um, folks who are um, helping with the tests, those gloves are invaluable, and we cannot thank you enough. You know, Josh mentioned that our 211 uh, line in the 211.org where you can make uh, contributions, we have almost 1,000. Uh, folks who have donated to the state of Connecticut right now, a whole variety of things, including PPE, and keep it going, because that's one thing I can count on, the people of the state of Connecticut. I've also been extraordinarily impressed with the ingenuity of the people of Connecticut, and I just uh, love talking to people and hearing what they're doing. You can sit around looking at uh, cable news and just getting frustrated, or at least while you're doing cable news, I was impressed by the number of folks with sewing machines who are making surgical masks. 
And I think Hartford Health has some designs on how to do it to spec, Jeff, if I'm not mistaken. I was reading about Custom Shop in Glastonbury, and they used to do a window treatments, whatever they are, and now they're making surgical masks. And uh, we have folks around the state who are making, donating them to uh, folks in need. And those are healthcare workers, obviously. Those are also first responders. Those are not-for-profits who are working in group homes. Those are police and cops. These are things that really have meaning, and I cannot thank you enough for that. I was sort of interested in Colin Cooper, our uh, head of manufacturing outreach, and talking about, as I described before, the parachute manufacturer who is now making surgical gowns. And I think they're pretty top quality. Jeff may want to uh, opine on that. I talked about the whiskey distiller, who's now uh, making um, uh, hand sanitizers, free hand sanitizers, free if you bring your own bottle. So we're beginning to step up as Connecticut people and do what we can. At the same time, we push every day the federal government to do the right thing. And uh, we do need volunteers. Uh, younger volunteers, uh, those that can help in a whole variety of ways. You go to 211. Uh, we've had over, I believe now, over a thousand nurses, folks who thought they were settling into a comfortable retirement, getting back in the game. We need folks who are about to uh, get out of medical school and nursing school who can come back. Other retired nurses, um, you can go to, um, I'll figure out what that website is a second, where you go to to make sure that you can contribute your help there. I was just at a food bank earlier today and food share. A lot of food coming in, a lot of food we need going out. We need volunteers there, volunteers to help sort the food as it goes there, gets it over to our food shelter, and adopt a senior. Adopt a neighbor who's maybe a little older. Those older folks who we do not want going out, we do not want them going out shopping. And if you can go pick up the food at the food pantry or pick it up at one of our takeout restaurants, that's the type of thing you can do to volunteer and step up and uh, make a difference there. So go to 211, go to CT Responds. Those are the two main sites where you can donate and make yourself um, really helpful in this time of need. You know, with that, I really thought it'd be helpful to have uh, Jeff come. Jeff, uh, as you know, runs uh, Hartford Health. They are on the front lines down in Bridgeport. They have a little bit of predictor of what may be coming to northern Connecticut in the future, working every day to make sure we're ready for the surge. Jeff? Thank you, Governor. Uh, and let me first begin by thanking you for your leadership in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I can personally attest uh, from our health system's perspective and hospitals and health systems across all of Connecticut, uh, the partnership we've had with state government has been absolutely exceptional, and it means a tremendous amount to us. The executive orders are truly impactful. Uh, the capacity that you've done to put nurses to work who are in training, to allow people who are retired to accelerate their ability to get relicensed, the capacity to bring people across state lines today uh, who otherwise weren't licensed in our state has been impactful. Uh, the ability to relax some of the standards from a regulation standpoint and move to almost a trust and verify perspective that gives us more agility to move more quickly. Uh, I cannot tell you how meaningful it's been, uh, the way that your responsiveness, your accessibility, uh, and the fact that we're speaking to you as frequently as we are so you have the best intel uh, as you make these decisions at this level. Uh, all health systems today are working in partnership, and it's really amazing to see the way the hospitals have come together. Uh, at this point in time, we don't wear uniforms. Right? We have one uniform, and that's the, the state of Connecticut. Uh, we're working together, we're planning together, we're responding together, uh, and we're communicating incredibly frequently. And it becomes critical during a crisis like this. What I see that's most inspiring, uh, incredibly rewarding, is to look at the people who are working on the front lines of healthcare across all of Connecticut today in every clinical setting. Uh, when other people are appropriately following the guidance from the governor uh, to shelter in place, to follow quarantine uh, proceedings, schools are shutting down, places of work are moving to at home and so forth. Healthcare workers are going into the crisis and that's what they do. And healthcare uh, people who work in this regard, they're heroes every day. They truly are, but it becomes never more apparent in moments like this. And to see the spirit of the people on the ground, they're, 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 first of all, their excellence, their competence, their empathy, uh, their sense of service, is absolutely remarkable. So people are, are strong, uh, they're, they're committed, and they're responding uh, to this crisis. The, the fact that there's been, uh, and the governor described it as innovation and the ingenuity that's occurring, 
is really important. Uh, we're seeing examples across the hospitals in Connecticut where people are piloting ventilators to, be, to now be shifted to care for two people uh, simultaneously, which nearly doubles the, the, the capacity. That type of innovation, that type of, of solving problems with new approaches, it's happening across all of our systems in many small and large ways, uh, which, are, which is truly critical. Uh, the the uh, generosity from the community, from large companies to individuals in their own homes, the outpouring of support has been incredible. And it means a lot to the people who are on the front lines working. Uh, they feel the support, they sense the support, it gives them inspiration, it gives them a sense of purpose, uh, and it gives them confidence in the work that they're doing in terms of the essential nature of the services they provide. The, the efforts around personal protection equipment could not be more important. Uh, this is one of the great challenges we have, not only here in Connecticut, but across the country. This is a global challenge. Uh, the efforts by the state have been enormously appreciated. The state is aggressive. Uh, they have a team under Josh's leadership that's actively trying to acquire uh, from across the globe. And they're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're working in concert with the state. Uh, and we're, we're spending at this point, in many instances, up to 10 times the original value of product. Because at moments like this, we're not worried at all about the economics. We're worried about how we serve the communities and how we do it the most effective way we can. So the, the efforts by all the supply chain professionals, both in the state government and within all the hospitals and health systems, they're playing an incredibly important role during this time period. As we, as we go forward, uh, I do want to recognize uh, the, the important work that's being done around coordination. Uh, this is a regional event. And we can anticipate, we're, we're, we believe that at least uh, the peak is likely being forecasted based on our best modeling today around the second week uh, of April. Um, so the, the efforts that have been put forth by the state, uh, the guidance that we took very early and very strong and decisive action, Governor, are truly important. Uh, the, the capacity for us to quarantine, to work to flatten this curve becomes very critical. Uh, we're still seeing shortages on things like testing in different uh, parts of the state and within different organizations. Uh, testing is critical. And when you look at what the CDC guidelines are today, testing relative to uh, uh, first and foremost patients who are in the hospital becomes most essential. Because our ability to rule people in or rule people out, out allows us to manage the critical resources of beds uh, and, and, and protective equipment as we go forward. Uh, secondly, uh, the screening that we need to do to support all people working in healthcare today. Uh, we need to make certain that we're providing every protection, both to the people providing the services at the front line and in addition to the people we're caring for. Uh, and third is how we have testing available to people in the community where it matters most. So people who are most vulnerable, people who have significant symptoms or exposure. Uh, and we are working in a much more coordinated fashion across the state. Uh, to manage our critical resources during this time with testing. Uh, so I, I have great gratitude, uh, first and foremost, to everybody uh, across the state who are working together. We're in this together, uh, and we're responding in a very significant way. Hospitals and health systems have to continue to do what we do. We're still birthing babies. We're still responding to heart attack care and stroke care. We're still providing trauma services and emergency-related services. That's what we do. Uh, and we are all standing strong, standing committed, uh, and working in a highly coordinated fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions? Governor, can I hear you say that the, um, the small business, uh, the bridge program that Connecticut started with $25 million has been depleted already? No, but uh, you heard me say we're putting on pause in terms of accepting new applications. Um, I think we had 2,500, 3,000 applications, maybe more since I started talking. And it just reminds people of the incredible need people had now to pay their bills, maybe uh, in anticipation of the feds coming in in a few weeks. Uh, I think we're probably going to double the capacity. It was originally a $25 million program, Christine, and I think we're going to make it 50, which we can still do within the parameters of the revolving fund. Josh, we asked you early in the week if you had any really hard numbers on just how many hospital beds we have, how many we will need. You mentioned that you're planning for worst case scenario, 10% uh, of the population to get it. Now that we're hearing it could peak in a couple weeks, do you have those numbers? Not only for beds, but maybe for nursing staff, doctors as well. Sure, well, as of today, um, 
across our healthcare system, our hospital system, we have um, 6,800, just over 6,800 beds uh, currently uh, available. Um, and the, the, the hospitals have been doing a fantastic job of clearing out a lot of beds. So uh, as we've discussed previously, elective surgeries, non, non-life-saving surgeries have been postponed in anticipation of this surge. That's a difficult financial hit for the hospitals, but they're doing the right thing to clear the hospitals out and make as many beds as available as possible. Um, still a relatively small percentage of those beds across the system, uh, about 15% are either COVID-positive patients or persons uh, under investigation uh, as being not yet tested positive but um, have test results out. So there's still, there's still um, and we're, we're at 61% um, census in our hospitals uh, as of today. So, so 30, it says differently, 39% vacant essentially in our hospitals today. So there's a lot, that's not equal across every hospital obviously. We know in Fairfield County there's a lot more stress on the system already, but generally as a state we have capacity in the system that said, we are working very hard with the hospital association, very tightly with a number of the commissioners in our emergency operations center, working on our capacity plan, our surge plans right now, um, in anticipation, as, as Jeff said, of uh, where this may peak in the coming weeks, looking at what we anticipate the maximum capacity that we'll need will be, and working both in terms of the existing capacity we have in our hospitals, all of our hospitals are doing some very creative work right now to shuffle patients around, free up floors, um, but even then we're anticipating we may need some additional space, so we're working, as I think I mentioned previously, at nursing homes that have recently been closed that we're going to reopen, other creative options. We're going to discuss that more publicly um, early next week um, as we finalize that plan. And I, I add to that, uh, the state, I think, took a very important action to, to deploy uh, the three uh, um, segments of the 25 beds to three different uh, hospital locations, which I think is important. It gives us more readiness and more capability. Uh, But we're also taking across Connecticut, all the health systems are taking different actions. Uh, Our system has a wonderful partnership with Trinity College. So we've put in place a relationship in Hartford with Trinity, where we're using their gymnasium facilities, we're using some of their food preparation areas, and we have commitments to their dormitories uh, in place. Uh, and I would really recognize the President Joanne Berger Sweeney, the board at Trinity, uh, who's been committed from the very first day to figure out ways to support uh, all the hospitals in the region. In Fairfield County, Sacred Heart University, President John Patillo, very similarly. Uh, President Patillo did everything possible to give us do- additional dormitory space. They happen to have some newer dormitories with uh, unique uh, restroom facilities and food facilities that make some of their campus very accessible to us. So there's tremendous creative solutions going on, and this is happening in each geography across the state of Connecticut, and it does give us more capacity, and it's about being prepared at the point in time when you need the capacity. So the the window has been now to do that preparation. Mr. Flax, can you tell us a little bit more about this collaboration uh, that you keep talking about? Uh, Do you essentially have a a working group, frankly, uh, of of the hospital association in conjunction with the governor and, and Josh? I assume that's what it sounds like. So certainly. So the collaboration, it's very strong. So it begins, first of all, we speak to the governor routinely uh, as a group of, of health system CEOs. Uh, and let me tell you, the governor begins and ends the meeting the same way with what can, well, how can he help? What more can the state do? What does he need to hear? What does he need to know? So we're giving him the best intelligence we can in terms of the legitimacy of our current circumstances and what we're anticipating. Uh, in addition to the meeting with the governor, we're in frequent conversation with both Josh and Chief of Staff Paul Mounds. So the collaboration with the state, is, is, it's very real, uh, and it happens in a very systematic way. But the, the, through the Connecticut Hospital Association, all of the uh, health system and hospital CEOs uh, come together uh, three to four times a week in a, in a pre-planned uh, phone call setting. Uh, but we also, through small groups, are doing different problem solving uh, together. So the association is playing a very critical role under the leadership of uh, the president, uh, Jennifer Jackson. Uh, but I, I really recognize uh, all the leaders across the state. I mean, this, this is about doing what's in the best interest of the community. And when we come together, that's the discussion. It's how can we learn from each other, what resources do we have, uh, how do we share best practices, and how do we come to decisions so that we can make sure the community is hearing things in a way that's both clear, digestible, transparent, uh, but also seeing consistency around our practices. We're seeing governors of neighboring states pleading with the federal government that 
they need supplies here in the state and they're being outbid by FEMA and the federal government. Is that anything that we're experiencing here in the state and have you had to deal with that? I can tell you we have orders that were scheduled for delivery um, now or early next week and now they're on back order. Maybe that means they overpromised. Maybe that means somebody came in with a higher bid. Uh, we're sourcing these very carefully. These are from reputable vendors, so I don't really doubt what that's going on. Look, as we talked about yesterday with the senators, it really should be essentially focused to purchasing effort rather than have every state out there on their own potentially bidding up the price of things. I'm trying to work my bids in association, at least with Gina Raimondo. We're constantly talking about make sure we do this together. Any numbers on how the front lines are holding up? Do you have any numbers on positive taste tests for health workers, hospitalization for health workers? I know you have a thousand new nurses coming in, but well, I can speak within our organization. So, so uh, again, recognizing we have 30,000 staff members who work within Hartford Healthcare, uh, we have had uh, less than, than than a handful of people uh, at this point, and I want to just protect you know their their confidentiality, but who have. Uh, tested positive as a result of, of uh, suspicion of care uh, being delivered. We've had a few people who work with us who've acquired it within the community, uh, understandably, and a few people who've been exposed through uh, business dealings early in the process. So I think the necessary precautions that are being taken, the, the uh, protective equipment being so critical, and the, the best practice procedures that are being embedded are important. So as an example, in, in our system, but it is happening in most systems around the state, uh, every uh, staff member who comes into the building gets a temperature test. So we're actively pre-screening people before they enter the building. Uh, and we are providing a mask uh, to every staff member who also works within our, within our setting uh, and in a, a mask that's appropriate to the work that they do. So there's, there's many different measures, but the early efforts, again, from the governor to restrict uh, uh, um, visitor access uh, has proven, I think, to be very impactful as time went forward. The early decisions to strongly stand down the vast majority of our ambulatory surgery capabilities preserved a significant amount uh, of personal protective equipment. So the, the early actions, the decisive nature of what was done uh, is yielding benefit now, uh, but there's still so much more work in front of us that's going to be tremendously challenging. For a thousand ventilators at the beginning of the week, what's the status on that order? And do we have a running tally of how many ventilators we have in the state right now? Yeah, so the thousand ventilators you're referring to was our second request of the national stockpile. The first being 500, so now we've got a total of 1,500 requested, and we haven't heard anything back yet from the federal stockpile. Mm -hmm. um, in terms, in terms of the existing inventory in the state right now, we have 932 ventilators. Um, across our hospital system currently. And how many will we need when this virus is expected to peak in two weeks? That's the plan that I alluded to earlier that we'll share more details on next week. Do you feel that lives may be lost if we don't get these ventilators in a quick time? Yes. I mean, I think uh, the governor's been clear about this. This is one of the most critical elements of the health care delivery system for this particular crisis that's going to be required. Can you address the um, essentially the, the continuing surge, for lack of a better term, coming in from New York into southern Fairfield County, frankly, and, and, and moving up the coast towards New Haven? Uh, are the hospitals ready for this? We just talked about a peak two, two weeks from now. Uh, take us through that on how the hospitals are ready for this. Well, when, first of all, on the ventilator question, I just find it unconscionable. We could look overseas. We could have seen the need for those ventilators uh, a few months ago. We had an opportunity to ramp up for that, and this is a life or death for some uh, seniors. So it's just imperative that we do everything we can to catch up on that and uh, really uh, you know, make sure that our major manufacturers are doing this 24-7 until we get it done. Um, yeah, Chris. Um, Look, we've been pretty strict about uh, telling everybody to stay at home, and that includes the people of New York City. Please stay at home. It's for your safety. It's for our safety. Um, if you are coming up here, uh, you maybe you have a house or some urgency, self-quarantine when you get here. Take your temperature. Make sure you're not putting your friends at risk, your neighbors at risk, or yourself at risk. That's something absolutely imperative, something our neighboring states are doing as well. And frankly, when it comes to flying to Florida, they want Connecticut to self-quarantine as well. 
This is just a shot in the dark going back to the ventilators. Do we know of any local companies in Connecticut that might be equipped to manufacture them right here in our state? Yes, we do. Discussions with a couple. No. <laughs> we heard that you put two people on one ventilator. Is this for like all the ventilators that you have in the state or is it is there a special ventilator for that? So it's an emerging innovation. Uh, it's, uh, there are hospitals in New York who are doing that today. Uh, and we've piloted it here uh, in one of our hospitals in Connecticut, and it's being piloted in a few others as well. Uh, so it, you know, we have to be careful if there's proper selection and approach, but uh, it is a way to, uh, we believe it will be, an, it is an innovation that will allow us to take care of more people uh, if necessary under that circumstance. You gave us some numbers on um, obviously people above 70, above 80, you gave some percentages on that. Um, what percentage, can you tell us, what percentage of, of, of the patients have been under 40, for example, and, and do young people have, have something to worry about? Yeah, we, we provide um, a lot of data in our daily reporting that I think answers your question, Chris. Um, I think we've actually enhanced the reporting today for the, the data geeks out there like, like uh, me, where we've now added denominators to some of these graphs where you can see the, both the infections and the hospitalizations on a per capita basis. So rather than just in absolute terms, um, we have enough uh, cases, unfortunately, where we can start to assess them as a percentage of the population of that age cohort. And you know what we're seeing is, is two things. One, when it comes to infections, positive cases, this is a virus that doesn't discriminate by age. Um, we do see a lot less infections under, under 20 years old. I think that's been well documented that children, fortunately, are not, uh, do not seem to be particularly uh, affected by this. But the infection rates are very consistent from you know, all the way through the ages. Um, but what's really striking is the hospitalizations, and it really skews towards the older uh, people who end up in the hospital. It's very consistent with what the governor has been warning, Dr. Carr has been warning, is that if you're over 65, if you have an underlying health condition, these are the people who have to take the most care to stay home, to self-isolate, because they're the most at risk of ending up in the hospital. Hey, Chris, can I say, what that means to me is um, for those young people that say, hey, uh, I may be getting infected, but it's a lot less likely that I'm going to get uh, hospitalized, which is true, but you are still infecting other people. That's why it is so important that you uh, stay close to home, respect those social distancing, respect those small groups, less than five, and thinking about the day after, whenever, how many months that is, when we get back to work, we'll probably be focusing a little bit first on some of those younger people who are much less likely to need hospitalization, more likely to be able to help get our economy going, but not before the time is right and safe. Mr. Governor, uh, gun stores are still open and in some cases seem to be quite busy. Uh, how did gun stores become deemed essential and will they continue to stay open in this period? I made that decision. I make all the decisions regarding public health, and I want to do everything I can to minimize the possibility of infection. And as I looked at some of the gun stores, I saw some groups and even lines and crowds surrounding some of them. And that's when I said, from a public health point of view, no more. Uh, you, I'm not closing these down. But what I am saying is you have to go there by appointment. And my purpose there is to make sure there's no more than one or two people in that store at any given time to make sure nothing can be transmitted. But you're smiling at me as if that law maybe is being winked at. I'd like to just relay the visual evidence, if that's all right. Drove by you know, on the way to the supermarket today, Route 5 in Newington. I won't name a store, but it's obvious. There's a lot more than, you know, there's, there's 10 cars in the parking lot. I know there's more parking out back than what it looks like. It looks like it's more than one or two. And I know that the, the gun control groups and the domestic violence groups have been asking. So, um, you know, I'm sure those groups are interested That's in That's an executive order. That's the law. We're going to enforce that. And uh, we're taking notes on what you just told us. Second week in April, people get excited, oh, it'll be over. But it's the peak, if the model is correct. I know it's all. What does the downside look like? How long out does your model look like? Can I explain the model a little bit more? Because this is kind of the first. Sure. So as Josh said, these are emerging, and we are working to coordinate with the state. So I want to be careful because it would be premature to speak to it in any, any detail. But what I would say uh, is we're modeling it uh, with, with uh, three different levels. Uh, so in terms of a, uh, if, if it's more modest than is anticipated, if it's what we expect, and if it's more severe. So a, a sensitivity analysis that allows us to plan. But 
Uh, I think the prudent thing, the responsible thing to do is what all, all of our health systems are doing. We have to plan for the most severe possibilities uh, and be as ready as we possibly can be for what may happen uh, and, and what may very well happen. Uh, so, you know, this, when you think about a peak being at some point in April, uh, it would carry forward for some time after that. Can two questions here. We had a viewer write in about the casinos in the state. I know you might not have the authority to close them or open them back up, but as far as we know, Foxwoods announced that they'd be closed for two weeks, which would mean they would open back up April 1st. That's a place where a lot of people from different states come to our state to, to gamble and to stay. What's your guidance or message to the tribes about opening back up on April 1st if they plan to do I that? think we're in a health care emergency. They did the right thing two weeks ago, and I think just like we're doing with the schools, uh, I think you should stay closed, uh, you know, again for the near term, at least another couple of weeks. I, I got to say, they did the right thing two weeks ago. I know out of the, um, uh, the federal acts that's about to be signed by the president, that does include $10 billion for the tribes and other, tribes across the country and other special situations. So the federal government is making sure that everybody um, gets some relief from the uh, sacrifices they're making. So you suggested that they should kind of go along with the school lines of when schools will open back up? Um, the right way? I strongly don't think they should open up at the end of what this last two weeks was. I think they should stay closed uh, until we say there's the end of the health care emergency. And just a second question here. You told me to keep asking you about the 60-day mandated grace periods for insurance companies. People are losing their health care in the middle of a health crisis. Are you going to mandate it? Uh, we're still thinking about that. I've talked to more um, health care professionals on this. They tell me there's going to be some uh, news coming very soon. I've talked to our congressmen and uh, legislative leaders. They have said health insurance premiums are covered under that loan act, uh, the, you know, the Small Business Forgivable Loan Act, so that's covered as well. But again, I've got to make sure that people's health care is covered until that federal act comes into place. And I'm pushing the health insurance people very strongly on that. But again, we're seeing health care companies in the state as of today denying those extensions. We know three of them are, so even though you're pushing them and urging them, uh, if it's not ordered or mandated by you through executive order, it seems like they're not going to follow. I'm running out of patience. Yeah. So will you, will you do it? What, when will it happen, I guess is the question. I'll let you know next week. All right. Governor, earlier this week we talked about state parks. Uh, they've been full to, uh, filled to capacity again the last two days. Has Katie Dykes come up with a number yet of cars that she's going to allow? Yeah, Can she we has. Minutes? We're going to, A, restrict the um, number of um, cars that can be in those parking lots. These are big parks, by the way, so just because the lot may be full doesn't necessarily mean that the, that particular park is full. She met with the friends of the parks, I think, today or yesterday. They're going to be out. If there's any groups that are congregating uh, in a group bigger than five, these friends will make a friendly reminder, separate. This is not safe. And I'd urge you to go to other places as well, not just the state parks. Go to the land trust trails and others. There are a lot of beautiful outdoor areas you can go to and enjoy as a small, small group. There will be someone counting cars and saying, okay, we have X amount of cars. No one else can come in. That's my understanding, yes. Governor, back to the gun question. Uh, do, do you feel there's a lot of fear out there? I mean, people are buying more guns. They're buying more ammunition. Um, do you feel there is fear out there, and do you feel it's it's founded on anything? Look, there's fear and anxiety out there. Um, I, I feel that. I hear that every day. I get the feedback. I hear the calls on 211. Uh, but look, I make every decision I make based upon public health. And uh, the same answers I gave before. If I see a crowd outside one of these gun stores, uh, that's uh, not allowed. And uh, we're going to enforce that on a public health basis. Jeff, what are some of the scenes from New York City mean to you as a hospital operator? Elmer's Hospital in Queens. You've seen some of the lines for testing and some of the, uh, the New York Post front page yesterday with the garbage bags. That's the worst case scenario. So, you know, how can Hartford avoid that? Well, first of all, our hearts go out to everybody in New York. Uh, you know, one thing I would say is, in general, I think we all need to resist talking about these as cases or even statistics, these are people. These are people we're talking about, and these are people's mother, grandmother, brother, father, best friend. Uh, we need to pay close attention to the fact that when you see what's occurring in New York today, right, it's devastating uh, in many ways. The New York hospitals are working at incredible levels to respond to this. We're in close communication with the New York hospitals, uh, so we're learning from their experience, first and foremost. 
uh, and, and we're making certain that we have the benefit of some time uh, for greater preparedness as a result of what they're experiencing. Uh, but secondly, again, I, I come back to the measures that this state took, that the governor put in place, the more important the efforts we have in place to flatten the curve, to limit travel, uh, to limit gatherings, uh, to, to, to manage uh, um, a lot of the shutdowns that have occurred across the state, right, the greater benefit we have to control uh, you know, some of the concerns that we would have within our state. And with all that being said, we have to plan for within our health systems across Connecticut as if we could be in that position. And when we would find ourselves in that position, what would we do? Which is why building out the uh, um, examples at Trinity College and Sacred Heart becomes so critical because you can't do it three days when, later when you think you're going to need it. Right? We, we have to do it now so that it's ready to go uh, and we have all of the capacities to have the agility to respond as necessary. And I think that's why the coordination across all the hospitals in the state becomes really critical uh, because we're in this together and we have to make certain that that level of planning and the rigor and the robust nature of it uh, occurs here in Connecticut. We stand on testing supplies. I know that we've talked a lot about PPE, but have we gotten more testing supplies so we can ramp up testing? I can tell you, for one, they've uh, changed the protocols a little bit. So the people with sanitary gloves is less of a manpower per uh, slow down now. That's going to allow us to do a little bit more testing in the near term. But some of the reagents and some of the other key ingredients we need to facilitate that testing are still in short supplies. So as Jeff can tell you, he's been very careful in rationing that. Yeah, we're being very thoughtful. Uh, there's, you know, there's, uh, in, in our particular example, uh, you know, we, we, we have had a very focused effort, again, first and foremost, making certain it's available in the hospitals critical to be available in the hospitals. You have to test patients, one, so you can treat them properly, two, so you don't waste PPE, and third, so you can move people out of the hospital who don't have COVID-19. So very, very essential for us to know who is in the hospital and who has COVID-19 and at what level. Secondly is, is how we give the ability for our, our people who work on the front lines to be tested uh, swiftly uh, because they're at risk of spreading it uh, very, very clearly. We want to protect them from uh, all circumstances. And third, when we, when we, uh, the reason why we have to be thoughtful about when and how we administer tests on the outpatient side uh, is getting back to the points around who's most vulnerable, who's had greatest exposure, who has greatest need. Um, so the testing is a challenge for us. There's not enough tests yet and the reagents and the kits that go along with it. Uh, but we're, we're responding. Uh, at Hartford Hospital, we now do testing uh, in the hospital. We've created our own capability. Yale New Haven Hospital has been doing its own testing. So these two institutions are capable of doing a few hundred tests a day. That really uh, strengthens our ability in the hospitals to more respond more quickly. And we're partnering with LabCorp and Quest and with, uh, Jackson Laboratories and the State Lab in Rocky Hills Essential. So we're using every resource we can across the state to strengthen our ability to, to do testing. But if it takes three, four, five days to get results, that, that, that is a problem. So we have to find more ways to test the right people and get results more quickly. And Christine, when Jeff talked about frontline, obviously those are folks working in the hospital. Those are folks working in nursing homes. Those are not-for-profit providers who have to uh, uh, deal with group homes. And these are all folks that I can't afford to have on the sidelines waiting for their test to see the way they can get back to work. It's really important. People work in home care. Very in essential. home care. Very essential. So, uh, I would hesitate to give you statistics. I don't want to be inaccurate. Uh, but right now, uh, uh, you know, for, for us, it's, it's, it's been uh, um, the percentage has not been significantly high. Um, so it, the numbers really do are, are consistent, as the governor said, that, you know, still the vast majority of people who are testing are being treated outside of hospitals. And then there's a good portion of people who are in hospitals or being cared for who are not in an ICU. So the ICU is still the smaller number at this point in time. That type of thing. Josh, do you have any data of, of people who, who were hospitalized uh, with COVID-19 and have been released? Uh, do we have any data on, on that? Yeah, it's, it's not a large number, but what do we know about that? Not yet. We don't, we don't have that data aggregated yet. Yeah. We'll be working on that soon. So, so the number is when you say, you know, how many people are positive in Connecticut, yeah. that's how many people have been positive in Connecticut, right. and it does not include anybody who has recovered. Correct. That's cumulative positive test results.
at some point will we have information? Yeah. So we're, we're now three weeks or so into this, as the governor mentioned, and so now we'll start measuring the people who've resolved and, and come out of the kind of active cases. Will you be giving uh, updates over the weekend? Should we expect more press conferences or numbers? We'll see, but there's a lot going on, and I think people deserve a right to know. Um, I will tell you, I was just informed by Paul that the president has signed the CARE Act. So that has gone through in um, lightning time, given the political process. And uh, I'll be talking to Joe Courtney in about 20 minutes to see how fast we can get um, the money here to the state. Paul Mounds, our chief of staff, is putting together a team, working with his legislative counterparts down in Washington, D.C. What's available to us per person? What are grants that we apply for to make sure Connecticut gets its fair share? On that point, uh, yesterday, uh, Senator Murphy, I believe, mentioned one to one and a half percent. In, in round numbers, do you know how much money may be coming to Connecticut or, or, or a range? Obviously, you don't know the precise number, but are we talking a billion and a half dollars or what are we talking? Well, the number I really care about is the, um, you know, 350 or 500 billion uh, that's uh, devoted to uh, going to the states because that we can use to pay for our operating expenses, and that's going to be at least a billion and a half to uh, the state of Connecticut. Get a little agitated, because uh, if you live in Wyoming, you're getting seven times more per capita than you are in the state of Connecticut, because a lot of this is based upon a minimum. Uh, the rest of this is being allocated to hospitals of um, well over 100 billion, or at least 100 billion. I think that's allocated. I'm not sure if that's per patient or uh, what that allocation is. But we're going to do that total analysis, and we'll have a very good idea within a week, Chris. Hey, with that, everybody, Christine, last question. Um, are you going to impose any more restrictions beyond your latest executive order? I think so. Look, this is a situation that seems to be changing by the hour. We've had a, a number of executive orders, and I'm sure we're going to have a few more. Thank you very much, everybody.